Well, I am sitting down today. <clears throat> Usually I try to be an upstanding citizen, but before I uh, came from Florida today, I'll speak plainly with you, I, my back gave out, and so I'm just trying to take it easy on my back. So uh, bear, bear with me on that, but I uh, trust that uh, even in the sitting posture, uh, the, uh, the, the Lord will uh, communicate his message to you all on an important topic that I find very helpful as I speak on university campuses. I was speaking in Denmark last spring and had a very fruitful conversation at uh, a university there and talked about some of these things. And there was a, a, a real engagement precisely because this has to do with a lot of feet on the ground Christianity. It's not merely good theory that we're talking about, but we're talking about the impact that the gospel has had. A lot of times people, uh, they want, yes, they're looking for answers. They're looking for a connection between, uh, you, know, their, you know, between the Christian faith and reality. They want to see that there's a good fit. Uh, but one of the ways in which we see that there is a good fit is in the actual outworking of the Christian faith. And Jesus himself said, by this all will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. And so I have found that as I've spoken on this topic of Jesus-shaped cultures and how the, the gospel has transformed societies across history, that there is a real resonance uh, to this very uh, topic. Now, I want to make sure that this actually works. So uh, you just have this um, uh, Windows screen, and I want to make sure that we are... <clears throat> connected here. Okay, there we go. Beautiful. Thank you, sir. I appreciate that. So, Jesus-shaped cultures. We have seen People like Mother Teresa, how her work of love in a place like Calcutta, I've been there uh, to see where she worked. I was there in 1984 and visited again in 2000 in Calcutta. And uh, to see the remarkable work, the remarkable labor of love there was just uh, astonishing. Uh, what an impact uh, her work had there in India, even in a very dark place. Uh, the work of missionaries have had a profound impact. And we'll, uh, you know, th th this just, we'll just talk about this a little bit later. Uh, but we've seen many moral gains in history thanks to the witness of faithful Christians. Now, there are plenty of atheists who will point the finger. They will be critics of the idea of religion itself. Th you think of Christopher Hitchens, who talked about how religion poisons everything. He wrote the book, uh, God is Not Great, and it, of course, is taken from the Muslim call to prayer, uh, which begins, Allahu Akbar, uh, God is great, or more literally, God is uh, greater. Uh, and, and Christopher Hitchens is saying, no, religion is bad. God is not good. God is bad for people. Religion poisons everything. But is that the case? Well, if you actually get down to it, when people start talking about religion, it's a very vague concept, isn't it? What do we mean? And it's helpful to ask people, what do you mean when you say religion? A lot of times people will be, uh, you know, they'll say, well, religion is belief in God. Well, Buddhists don't believe in God. Well, religion involves worshiping someone. Well, I've seen people in North Korea worshiping, seemingly worshiping, uh, peop, you know, their, their, their particular uh, leaders, Kim Jong-il or Kim Jong-un, or even Mao Zedong, who had a very strong hold and, and was very do a very dominant authority in, uh, in communist China. 
But religion is very difficult to define. Martin Marty, who is a, an expert on religion himself from the University of Chicago, says that there will be no, dis, there will be no agreement on the definition of religion. Uh, there, he's, he knows at least 17 different definitions of religion. So it, it's a little bit of a murky term that is being used here. And we'll, we'll also, you know, I think it, what's more helpful to keep in mind is the concept of worldview. Everyone has a worldview. Everyone has an outlook on life. Everyone has a belief about reality, about knowledge, about morality. And so often people think, oh, secularism is the default position. That's the neutral, philosophically appropriate position to take. But yet, that position itself is not simply to be taken for granted. It is, a, it is making a claim, for example, I mean, that God does not exist, and that claim needs to be justified. It's not as though that is, the, uh, you know, that is the, the intellectually respectable position, everything else uh, is questionable. No, that position itself needs to justify itself in making those knowledge claims. Also, we need to remember that that you know, a lot of things have been done in the name of religion that are bad, but a lot of things have been done in the name of atheism that are bad. Uh, we think of the harm that has been done through uh, Mao Zedong. Seventy million people dying under Mao Zedong. Stalin, 20 million people dying under his rule. He was an atheist. In fact, my grandfather... Uh, died of starvation as a result of being put into a labor camp in the Ukraine through Stalin's implementation of this forced collectivization that resulted in this uh, widespread famine and, and starvation. <clears throat> also, we need to remember that e when we are talking about traditional religions, they're not all created equal. There are distinctions between them. You look at the example of Jesus in contrast to the example of Muhammad. You look at, and we'll talk about this in a moment, uh, various male Hindu deities. Would you rather have your child imitating male Hindu deities or Jesus? Good question to ask maybe a, a, a devotee of uh, Krishna or some other male deity in India. Would you rather have your child imitate Jesus of Nazareth or one of these male Hindu deities? The contrast is remarkable. So here's where we're going to go. And again, you have a handout, so I've given you the, uh, some of the meat, uh, some of the quotations and everything that we'll be covering. But I wanted to look at India as a case study to draw out the contrast that I'm trying to make as we look at the impact of the gospel. Let's look at a place like India, where you know some people will say, oh, don't worry about those people in those other countries, you know, when they're talking about missionaries going to other places and, quote, converting them. That seems so arrogant. They're happy the way that they are. Folks, don't believe it. Yes, some people may be, quote, happy without the gospel. You know, some people talk about, look, Sweden, you know, a lot of atheists there, but they seem to be so happy. Well, you notice there has been a dramatic impact of the gospel in Northern Europe. It's not as though that just somehow happened as a result of atheism. There's a lot of groundwork that was laying there thanks to the Christian faith that brought so many goods to Western society, like the emphasis on human rights and equality and so forth. So let's not neglect that. But you, you look at a place like India. I've got a son who lives in India uh, right now. He's actually home for the, the, a, a longish break, but he's doing his master's degree, and he's been in India, and he has told all sorts of remarkable stories about the caste system, about discrimination, about the mistreatment of women, about how women are treated as uh, less than human very often. Uh, there's a worldview behind that, my friends. Let's not forget about that. So we're going to look at India as a case study. We also want to look at the organic nature of ideas and their consequences that, that come about. So we're going to look at this notion of roots, shoots, and fruits that a friend of mine, Tom Wolf, has, uh, has put together, and I find it very helpful as we look at the impact that the gospel has had in contrast to uh, a place like uh, India, a religion like Hinduism. 
and its ideas and their consequences. And then thirdly, we'll look at how faithful Jesus followers have shaped Western culture. Uh, that uh, we'll see certain gains that have come through the living out of the Christian faith, particularly in Western society. And then finally, we'll look at the reinforcement of this very notion of the biblical faith when it's lived out having an impact in society and how non-theists recognize this very readily. That it's not as though we're just kind of picking our own people and saying, look, this Christian says it, that Christian says it, no, actually, you know, we can, you know, the Beatles said, you know, I, I get by with a little help from my friends. Well, we've got some atheist friends that we can, you know, call in to, uh, to support our side on this. There are very strong cases that those atheists are making about the impact that the Christian faith has had. So let's start talking about India. <clears throat> Back in December of uh, 2012, Five years ago, or three years ago, a 23-year-old girl, um, a physical therapy student uh, near Paya, was gang raped and brutalized on a public bus in Mumbai, India, and she ended up dying as a result. And this created a, this really rocked India. This was, you know, such a high-profile case precisely because it was a, a young woman who was of a high caste in India. You know, the Brahmin caste. And uh, a lot of people said, this is terrible. How could this happen? And these people who were of a lower caste did this to her. And this is a great offense within Hindu Hinduism. What's interesting, though, is that what, what ta often doesn't get reported or is minimized in India is that when you are of a lower caste and this happens to you, that doesn't seem to matter. That doesn't seem to get people upset. So those who are without power, those who are diminished in Hindu society, uh, you can take advantage of them, but once you do this to someone who is at the top, that is when it becomes problematic. That is when uh, outrage uh, really starts to, to hit the press. Now, this sort of a thing, this rape culture, uh, someone has written, uh, written an article on this, and it's very, very revealing about the roots of rape in India. And I've given you a few quotations on this that I think are very, uh, very fascinating. Uh, and this article uh, mentions in this Deccan Chronicle, it says, rape has of late become an acute disease in the Indian society. Prima facie or on the surface, this is a problem arising out of a mental disorder, but there is also a larger cultural context that to an extent explains how the Indian male became so brutal. Ideas have consequences. And we see this, someone from India uh, talking about this very frankly within his own society. Daily reports of infants being raped across the length and breadth of a country is a phenomenon unique to India, a society that's otherwise highly conservative. Clearly the institutional upbringing, including that in family, needs to undergo change. And then it goes, the article says, we cannot leave it entirely to the police or the judiciary to tackle such heinous acts, for rape is also a cultural problem. And it is a more serious problem because of the extermination of the victim. We need to treat the malaise from its very roots. There is no appreciation per se, and here's where it gets, uh, where, where we see, there's no appreciation of a healthy man-woman relationship which is rooted in the concept of equality. I wonder where that came from where you see that emphasis on women's rights, where you see that emphasis on equality, follow the J-shape, my friends. Look for how the gospel has started to creep into that sector of society or civilization. Look for the influence of Jesus there. You'll track it down. The biblical faith having an impact. There's one uh, judge in India by the name of uh, Ram Chet Malani uh, who's, who talks about this Hindu deity, Ram, who was a bad husband. Interestingly, he's named after this deity. But he says, Ram was a bad husband. I don't like him at all. Just because some fisherman said something, he sent that poor woman, Sita, his wife, into exile. You know, so he believed a false report from these fishermen and hence exiled uh, his, his wife. Um, 
The list goes on. You pick your male deity in, in Hinduism. Now, it's been said that there are 330 million Hindu deities. Uh, that's just a tradition. It's not as though they actually did a, you know, a, a scientific count uh, of all the deities, but that's a, a kind of a common tradition of 330 million deities in India. But the males have a certain reputation. We have the god Shiva who insisted on entering the bathing area uh, arena of the goddess Parvati and did so by eliminating a child who is keeping guard at the open door. There's this lusting, there's this fornicating that is quite common with the Hindu deities. And then there's Krishna, so beloved in India. In the book, the Bhagavad Gita is a book written in honor of Lord Krishna, who stole the clothes of women while they were bathing in the Yamuna River. He did so to tease them and for the pleasure of watching the beauty of their naked bodies. Well, this is what the article goes on to say. We hang miniature paintings of the same act in our homes proudly. The young men who grow up seeing this or listening to the story told in an amused tone are bound to not find such an act abhorrent. Yeah, you get used to it after a while. You think, hey, this is okay, this is normal, um, treating women as objects. You just become accustomed to it. Uh, Alexander Pope, in one of his poems, said, Vice is a monster of so frightful a mean, that is, or appearance. Vice is a monster of so frightful mean, as to be hated needs but to be seen. Yet seen too oft, familiar with her face, we first endure, then pity, then embrace. You get used to it after a while, it just kind of rolls off your back. It doesn't seem to be as terrible as you first thought it was. And this is what is happening in Hindu homes. The gods treating women with this kind of disrespect. <clears throat> and the article goes on to say, Our mythology tells us what a husband does is right, that his will is greater than the woman's. If a mythological hero is praised for his acts of killing, drinking, and fornicating with multiple women, it is glorification of such behavior. You see, when Hindu gods engage with women, it's to strike or curse them or use them as sexual objects. You can bet this is going to shape the way that a society thinks. So let's go on a little bit further <clears throat> to talk about how ideas have consequences. So let's talk about roots, shoots, and fruits. <clears throat> how do we change the mindset of a culture? Uh, my friend Tom Wolfe says that uh, while all cultures are sick, some are sicker than others. How do cultures become change prone rather than change resistant? when positive things can come in and reshape a culture, is there, like the gospel, you know, is there resistance to this sort of a thing? Uh, do some people just want to stay in power rather than helping those who are uh, you know, of, of a lower caste or those who uh, are without a voice in their culture? Simply changing laws is going to be inadequate. Uh, the Roman uh, writer uh, Tacitus said that the more corrupt the republic, the more laws. In other words, if once character breaks down, once virtue breaks down, then what you're left with is basically trying to prop things up by law and by law enforcement, but it actually doesn't transform a society. Something more profound is needed. And so when we look at the roots, shoots, and fruits, we can put it into another form of a world voice, a world view, and a world venue. And this world voice is the voice of a prominent spokesman. It could be a uh, you know, spokeswoman, uh, you know, Jesus, Muhammad, uh, Buddha, Shiva, Marx. These root voices that articulate a certain way of thinking about the world, and then the worldview that is shaped around that voice, the philosophical and religious and intellectual precepts that, uh, that, uh, that take shape as a result of that voice being uh, articulated and, and theology is being created around those voices, and then the actual living out of those 
theologies, the, the living out of those worldviews, uh, the visible expression of beliefs through concrete social customs and practices, or the fruits of those ultimate voices. <clears throat> so, as we look at these three roots, shoots, and fruits, and now apply them to the Western, to Western civilization in particular, we want to see how this actually is cashed out in, uh, in the society that we're familiar with. Um, one historian wrote about the earliest Christians. Uh, Wayne Meeks said this about the outlook that the earliest Christians were presented with. Just imagine, for example, that you're a slave. You are without rights. You are property in the Roman Empire. Uh, you are, your status is looked down upon. But then you hear about the gospel. And you hear that there is a God who made me in his image. That there is a God who sent his son into the world to rescue me, to bring me into a new standing with him. That there is a God who gives me a new family by which I can identify myself. I can find security in that sort of a relationship of acceptance in the body of Christ. I can, you know, I, I have as my model someone who is not so removed from me, but someone who came to die naked on a cross, dying the death of a slave. That is a powerful image that transformed the earliest Christians. And so Wayne Meeks says, would then the intimacy of the Christian groups become a welcome refuge? The emotion-charged language of family and affection and the image of a caring personal God, powerful antidotes, while the master symbol of the crucified Savior crystallized a believable picture of the way the world seemed really to work? Here you have God stepping into the world and utterly transforming it through Jesus Christ. And this begins to reshape the lives of people. They say, no, this, not what the Roman system says, but what Jesus has done. Jesus is Lord. And he comes and presents an inverted kingdom with new priorities. So rather than running after the things that the Gentiles seek, and they seek first the kingdom of God, they themselves start to be transformed by this new vision. And as we get to the second century, the anonymous epistle of, uh, to Diognetus tells us about these Christians. It says, these Christians dwell in their own countries, but simply as sojourners. As citizens, they share in all things. Oops, sorry about that. Um, and yet, uh, you know, and they share all things with others, yet endure all things as if foreigners. They have a common table, but not a common bed. They're in the flesh, but they do not live after the flesh. They pass their days on earth, but they are citizens of heaven. They obey the prescribed laws and at the same time surpass the laws by their lives. They love all men and are persecuted by all. They are unknown and condemned. They are put to death and restored to life. They are poor, yet make many rich. They are in lack of all things and yet abound in all. They are dishonored and yet in their very dishonor are glorified. Do you want to know some people like that? Would you like to be people like that? May the Lord help us uh, to uh, replicate that kind of dedication. Well, let's fast forward to the 16th century where we have the Protestant Reformation. Now, we have people like Luther and Calvin who are emphasizing certain themes that had been lost or had been diminished in uh, previous centuries. And so you have the emphasis on what ends up becoming really the democratizing uh, roots of the Protestant Reformation, focusing on three core transformative values. The priesthood of all believers. We don't need to go through a, a priest to have access to God. Ephesians chapter, Hebrews chapter 4 says, let us boldly approach the throne of grace so that we might have mercy and grace to help us in our time of need. 
We can come boldly. We have access through Jesus Christ. We are priests. We are a kingdom of priests. We are priest kings who are restored to our vocation. Just as ancient Israel was, uh, was described as being a, a, a royal priesthood. There's the kingly and the priestly. Christ has, through his death, restored our human vocation to make us priest kings. He has made us a kingdom of priests to our God, and we'll reign upon the earth. There is that picture in Revelation as well. So the, the priesthood of every believer before God, also the right of every believer to study the Bible for himself in his own language, there is that, you know, rather than it being left in Latin without people being able to access this in their own tongue, Martin Luther saw this as a priority for getting the scriptures into the hands of the people that they might understand it, seek to understand it for themselves. Now, there are certainly problems with this. We need to read the, we need to read the scriptures historically. We need to read the scriptures in community. We need to read the scriptures cross-culturally. So we're not saying that I'm just my own interpreter and I don't need to pay attention to any of these other people who've been interpreting the scriptures. No. But there is that privilege that we have of being like the Bereans, of, of reading the scriptures, searching the scriptures to see whether the things that even the Apostle Paul was saying were true. And so we have also the appropriateness of pursuing any honest vocation to the glory of God. You go to a place like India, and you've got, you know, basically the, uh, you know, the the body of, of Brahma, the the creator. You know, he there is the at the very top. You know, are the the Brahmin, uh, you know, you know the Brahmins of the the high the high the high priestly caste. You know, and then you have the you know then you have the uh, you know the, the the soldiers, then you have the merchants, then you have the the, the common workers. You, know, you have the caste system built into the theology of Hinduism, and you have some tasks that are more degrading than others, some tasks that are just, uh, you know, that, that are for the benefit of, you know, they're just to serve the upper crust of society. Not so with something like the Reformation, where we see that all our work, even to the point of eating and drinking, can be done to the glory of God. Well, the Protestant Reformation and its impact uh, have not been lost on even people like an atheist historian, Niall Ferguson. Uh, who's been at Harvard University, he's a British historian, but he, he talks about six killer apps that have propelled the West uh, into uh, really creating a, a strong civilization. And one of those apps includes this, this work ethic that comes out of the Protestant uh, movement. Uh, other, other things he includes are the science and modern medicine, property rights and a free market and so forth. So, so there is this recognition by somebody like a, a Niall Ferguson who says, no, the Protestant Reformation has brought certain significant goods that ought to be appreciated. Another good that we see is that of modern science. Those who have been pillars in modern science, those who have shaped modern science, have been Bible believers. Modern science didn't begin with Charles Darwin. In fact, Charles Darwin, even in his, in his book uh, on the origin of species, he refers to a God who brings about these various forms of life, that he breathes life into these early life forms. That's Charles Darwin. So he, so he was affirming, you know, even if in a deistic sort of way, that there was a role that God had to play in, uh, in, in the creation. But we see, you know, even you know, well beyond uh, 1859 when, the, when this book was written, you know, we see that the roots of modern science are, being, are, are firmly planted and it is Bible believers, those who believe that God created a universe out of nothing, that he created the universe with certain laws in place. He created this world to be a rational world that could be studied, that could be even you know, appreciated and delighted in by uh, his creatures. And so we have J.J. Thompson, who, uh, you know, who was a professor at Cambridge University, and he placed over his door uh, in the Cavendish laboratory, laboratory this verse from the Bible. Uh, Great are the works of the Lord. They are studied by all who delight in them. Modern science. And we have somebody like uh, Paul Davies, a physicist, you know, not, a, not a Christian, 
but he is certainly sympathetic with the impact that the Christian faith has had on science. And he says, science began as an, un an outgrowth of theology, and all scientists, whether atheists or theists, accept an essentially theological worldview. This has been uh, reiterated by, or, you know, said even earlier by uh, Robert Oppenheimer, the physicist, who talks about the Christian understanding of work and how this plays out in, in science, that, uh, that there is a responsibility that we have to understand our world and to do uh, good work in that world. Rodney Stark, sociologist at Baylor University, he said that the roots of science have rested entirely on religious foundations and that people who brought it about were devout Christians. Now, it's interesting about Rodney Stark. Rodney Stark back in, say, 2006, uh, identified himself as an agnostic. About five years later, I sent him a note, uh, and I just said, you know, I noticed you identified yourself as, self as an agnostic. Uh, where do you see yourself now in your understanding of God, the Christian faith, or whatever? He said, well, I now identify myself as a Christian. He said, I basically wrote myself into the Christian faith. He studied the impact of the Christian faith in history, and he saw how powerful this work was, the, that Christians were making an impact where they went, when they're living faithful, devoted lives, following Jesus Christ. They were making an impact, and that really, you know, that, that really stood out to Rodney Stark. When it comes to bioethics, the same sort of thing happening with the encroachments of medicine uh, on the human person, on the image of God, on, uh, on you know, the, the infringements uh, and the encroachments that come to the human person in light of modern uh, you know, medicine and scientific uh, technologies, uh, that this had a way of eclipsing people, and so there was a great concern. And it was Christians who actually rose up and stood up to try to defend human persons. It was really the, the Christian, the biblical tradition, the theological roots of the biblical faith that helped inspire these people, people like Daniel Callahan, who, you know, who said this. He says, when I first became interested in bioethics in the mid-1960s, the only sources were theological or those drawn from within the traditions of medicine themselves, heavily shaped by religion. We can go on and talk about that, but let me move on to various democratizing gains for humanity. The political scientist Robert Woodbury uh, of the National University of Singapore wrote a, a groundbreaking article it was an award-winning article, and he wrote this article that required the, the journal editors required 190 more pages of documentation because they just couldn't believe what they were reading in what Robert Woodbury was proclaiming, namely that it was Protestant missionaries who were at the forefront of bringing moral reforms who are bringing literacy and education to people, not just the elites, but to all people uh, where they were going. And so he gave a list of those things, the development and spread of religious liberty, mass education, mass printing. Why are they engaging in mass literacy and mass printing? They want to get the Bible into everyone's hands. So they're engaged in, you know, it's a very Protestant reformational sort of thing, isn't it? Why don't you get the hands of the people, teaching them to read? So education, literacy, printing, all of these things were very important to these Protestant missionaries. They're engaged in most major colonial reforms like abolishing slavery, widow burning, foot binding in China, female circumcision, prepubescent marriage of girls, etc. And the codification of legal, legal protections for non-whites in 19th and early 20th centuries. So you'd often have these missionaries who were standing between the colonial powers and the indigenous peoples, and they were seeking equality before the law for all of them. These missionaries were, the, you know, a lot of times people say, oh, the colonialism. Well, you know what? Who's standing between those colonial powers and those indigenous peoples? It's often those missionaries who are bringing about these sorts of moral reforms. What about the emphasis of, on human rights? Uh, here again, we have the record of the Christian faith or the biblical faith as informing 
this discourse on human rights that we have. So the Declaration of Independence, we're very familiar with this. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, they're endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness. Of course, the founding fathers held that to be uh, the pursuit of virtue and, uh, and a human flourishing, not uh, hedonistic pursuits as we think of it today, but uh, it was the classical understanding of, uh, of happiness that uh, comes from the Greek uh, tradition, say, of Aristotle, of, of well-being, uh, eudaimonia, and so forth. Um, you also have, following on the heels of that, France's Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen, rights being affirmed in the presence and under the auspices of the supreme being. Notice the connection between human rights and this supreme being, this God who has made uh, human beings. And then we, you know, again, another uh, key document in light of the uh, Second World War with all of its atrocities and dehumanizations, you have Eleanor Roosevelt who spearheads this United Nations Universal Declaration on Human Rights and <clears throat> this emphasis on the inherent dignity and the equal and inalienable rights of all members of the human family, etc. This document was framed largely by Christian groups and individuals in consultation with uh, various rabbis. But this was, uh, again, you know, Marianne Glendon at Harvard University talks about this being fundamentally shaped by Christians, but they, they didn't use direct language because they were trying to get a lot of people, a lot of countries to sign on, uh, you, know, sign, you know, like countries like the Soviet Union, you know, officially atheistic and so forth, you know, you know uh, these sorts of countries would not want to sign on if God were specifically mentioned. But it does mention the inherent dignity of human beings, that they have been endowed with conscience and so forth. It doesn't say who endowed them, but there is that, uh, there is that understanding behind that statement because it's been formed by these, uh, these uh, Bible believers. Uh, the human rights scholar Max Stackhouse at Princeton says that intellectual honesty demands recognition of the fact that what passes as secular Western principles of basic human rights developed uh, nowhere else than out of the key strands of biblically rooted religion. Well, some people have appealed to various uh, possibilities to explain this away. Maybe human rights came from somewhere else, like Greek democracy or uh, the Renaissance uh, or the en Enlightenment. Uh, maybe these account for the, you know, the emphasis on human equality and rights and so forth. Well, uh, it's not quite like that. Uh, for one thing, Greek democracy was not democracy as we understand it, uh, to be sure. Uh, it was very, uh, very hierarchical. Uh, slaves, for example, in uh, according to Aristotle, were, were animated tools. Uh, you, know, you think that calling someone as a tool is a modern, uh, modern term? No, uh, Aristotle was talking about humans being, uh, you know, slaves being animated tools uh, in a much more degraded uh, sense, even. Um, that uh, some humans are slaves by nature. Uh, and they saw manual labor as being undignified and that, uh, that society should be run by these philosopher kings, these people who really know better than the rest. You know, contrary to what uh, William Buckley said, if you wanted to you know, get people to run the country, he'd, ra he'd rather pick, you know, you know, uh, you know, pick randomly names out of the telephone book uh, than, uh, than the people who uh, happened to be in office at the time. <clears throat> The uh, philosopher, again, ag ag agnostic, Jean, uh, his, uh, Luc Ferry, he, he talks about this, this aristocratic world. Uh, so Greek democracy is not really democracy. Uh, this cradle of democracy is really uh, quite uh, a far cry from, uh, from what we today understand as democracy. Well, what about uh, human rights arising from the Renaissance? Well, the Renaissance here, too, is a very Christian movement. It is kind of like, think of John Milton and Paradise Lost. He uses a lot of pagan imagery. He uses a lot of uh, classical imagery. But it's not as though this is somehow making him a pagan. No, he is a Puritan. He got a little bit of his Trinitarian theology was, was goofed up, but still very much within the biblical tradition. But yet he was doing the same sort of thing that was being done within the Renaissance, uh, using classical imagery. Uh, and and the, when we talk about humanism, 
I mean, Martin Luther was a humanist. He was a Christian humanist who, who drew from this pool of classical literature, of uh, rhetoric, of, uh, you know, of, and so forth, these things that characterized what we would today call the humanities. This was not a, you know, I you know Francis Schaeffer got this wrong. I appreciate Francis Schaeffer, but he was incorrect on this. But, uh, but Renaissance humanism was very strongly, very strongly Christian. Uh, and, uh, and Jacques Barzan, in his, uh, in his book on the dawn of, uh, From Dawn to Decadence, uh, you know, reinforces this very point. What about the Enlightenment? A lot of people say, no, the Enlightenment brought religious tolerance, it brought equality and so forth. And, uh, and you know, is this actually the case? Well, uh, again, here we need to understand that a lot of the people who are the movers and shakers in the Enlightenment movement itself grew up in Protestant, even Puritan homes. So we have people like Hugo Grotius, uh, John Locke, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, Benjamin Franklin, uh, you know, all these people that we, we, we associated with this, this age of reason, this age of enlightenment, so forth, so many of them, them had themselves been shaped by a biblical worldview. And so we can also talk about how even the scriptures informed contracts that were going on earlier than the time of John Locke and, uh, and, uh, and, and uh, Thomas Hobbes. So uh, Stephen Hopgood talks about the post-enlightenment use of human rights has been a secularization of its biblical root roots. Humanism, the cultural precondition for human rights, was a secular replacement for the Christian God. So there's this widespread recognition. We can you know, just jump on that here very briefly. And again, we're, um, again, like the Egyptian mummy, we're pressed for time. So uh, we'll try to wrap up soon. <clears throat> <clears throat> So here we have Jürgen Habermas, who is a leading philosopher in Europe, who talks about the Jewish emphasis on justice and the Christian emphasis on love, bringing to us all these goods of, emancio, of equality, of democracy, of universal rights, and so forth. This, again, not a Christian, but someone who recognizes the biblical faith as informing our emphasis on human rights. He says, any attempt to try to explain this in some other way, he says, this is just idle postmodern talk. Then there's the atheist thinker Jacques Derrida, who said the same sort of thing. You sh he talks about how this, uh, this law of human dignity, of the sacred in humans, uh, he says, this comes out of the Christian concept of, you know, of you know, the Christian heritage, the Abrahamic heritage, the biblical heritage. Without it, we wouldn't have this in our discourse. The biblical worldview has shaped our talk on this. Uh, the agnostic philosopher Luc Ferry, whom we've cited earlier, uh, he, he says the Christian idea of human equality was unprecedented at the time and one to which our world owes its entire democratic inheritance. Remarkable. Again, this has been not just Westerners, but even the Chinese. Uh, a research group there did a study on what made the West so strong in, in, in its stability, stable institutions and so forth. And uh, this one, uh, one spokesman for this organization, CAS, the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences, said we thought it was because you had more powerful guns, you know, maybe it's because you had a better, better political system. He says, next we focused on your economic system and so forth. But then they figured that, the, no, the heart of your culture is your religion, Christianity. That is why the West has been so powerful. The Christian moral foundation of social and cultural life was what made possible the emergence of capitalism and then the successful transition to democratic politics. We don't have any doubt about this. So again, we can, you know, the agnostic uh, political scientist Gunter Levy uh, also talks about how it is the Christians who have this understanding of a savior, their master who has suffered dying naked on a cross that informs their sense of compassion and concern for those who are uh, helpless, those who are in need. He said, yeah, you'll get people who might protest at, uh, you know, at, at, at rallies and so forth, you know, who are, you know, who, you know, who th consider themselves good secularists, but they're not going to be sitting at the bedside of a dying person. An ethic of moral autonomy and individual rights so important to secular liberals is incapable of sustaining and nourishing values such as altruism and self-sacrifice. Again, look for the J shape in our culture. 
Uh, my friend uh, Dr. Tom was uh, Tom Wolf was talking about how he, you know, he lived in India and how he was meeting with people. He, he met with some talking with some Hindu uh, on the plane on a plane trip to uh, back to India, and this Hindu was saying. No, why does why do those Westerners always say thank you for this and that? You know, it just seems like he said, well, it's because of the the Christian heritage, this spirit of gratitude. The Christian faith is a religion of gratitude, and so it it overflows in even the small social customs that they have. That's the the residue of the J shape. Um, Malcolm Muggeridge, when he was when he was uh, an, you know an agnostic. He, you know, in Indian Africa, he said he witnessed much righteous endeavor undertaken by Christians of all denominations. He says, I never, however, came across a, a hospital or orphanage run by the Fabian, the Socialist Society, or a humanist leper colony. He just noticed that it was the Christians who typically did this sort of a thing. Now, let me mention just Brian Stewart here, and I'll just wrap up with this, and then we'll take, take time for your questions. Uh, Brian Stewart, who became a believer by watching Christians at work in the world. Uh, BBC, or sorry, Canadian Broadcasting Corporation uh, reporter, he says, I found there is no movement or force closer to the raw truth of war, famines, crises, and the vast human predicament than organized Christianity in action. And there is no alliance more determined and dogged in action than church workers ordained and lay members when mobilized for a common good. It is these Christians who are right on the front lines of committed humanity today. And when I want to find that front, I follow their trail. It is a vast front stretching from the most impoverished reaches of the developing world to the hectic struggle to preserve caring values in our towns and cities. I have never been able to reach those front lines without finding Christian volunteers already in the thick of it, mobilizing congregations that care, and being a faithful witness to truth, the primary light in the darkness, and so often the only light. Now I, come to, now I came to this admiring view slowly and reluctantly. At the start of my career, I'd largely abandoned religion, for I too regarded the church as a rather tiresome irrelevance. What, I, what ultimately persuaded me otherwise, and it took a lot of persuading, was the reality of Christianity's mission, physically and in spirit, before my very eyes. I'm often asked if I lost belief in God covering events like Ethiopia, then called the worst hell on earth. Actually, like others before me, it was precisely in such hells that I rediscovered religion. I saw so many countless acts of human love and charity, total respect for the most forsaken, for all life. A remarkable testimony. Kind of like Rodney Stark writing himself into the Christian faith. He, you know, he, he was a journalist. He, 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 he reported himself into the Christian faith. <clears throat> A few r remarks in closing. The Christian faith's positive impact in history doesn't itself prove that the Christian faith is true. We need to understand, need to understand that. Uh, that would be what's called the, the genetic fallacy, uh, ascribing the truth or falsity of a belief to, uh, to uh, its, uh, its uh, originating point. Um, you think of Mormons, there are a lot of decent people there. Of course, they've been shaped by the, the biblical faith as well. Um, but, um, but we don't draw the conclusion that the Mormon faith must be true um, simply because there are decent people uh, within Mormonism. However, when we look at the arguments for the God-morality connection, and I've done a lot of work on the moral argument for God's existence, there's a lot there to connect the the existence of a good moral, you know, or a good uh, being, a good creator who makes human beings in his image with dignity and worth and so forth. This makes a lot better sense than we are simply the products of uh, these valueless, uh, materialistic, deterministic, uh, non-rational processes that have somehow produced valuable uh, beings. Uh, God makes a lot more sense of this. <clears throat> We also, uh, when, we, when, we, uh, when unbelievers want to see the Christian faith, they want to see more than just its coherence, but they want to see it lived out. And we've already talked about this. Jesus said, you will know them by their fruits. Uh, and, and as we look at the Hindu culture in contrast to uh, a Jesus-shaped culture, uh, we see that there is a marked difference between them. To say, oh, all religions are basically the same. Uh, no, take, a, take another look. You see that there is a, a, a striking difference here. <clears throat> those who say, oh, just leave them alone, those people are happy the way that they are. Uh, people who are, you know, think of the women who were uh, forced into foot binding 
or into widow burning, that they had to throw themselves on the funeral pyre of their dead husbands, uh, or female circumcision, or uh, women being, you know, girls being forced into these, uh, these prepubescent marriages, and so forth. Think about the reforms that have come about, how certain goods have been achieved through the, the, the good work of, uh, of Christian missionaries and so forth. Uh, they're not happy the way that they are. Uh, the gospel has brought much good, much light, much hope uh, to these people in, in such darkness. Uh, <clears throat> I worked with Ravi Zacharias for, a, for about five, year, five and a half years, and uh, he would sometimes quote a, a former Muslim, a, a convert to the Christian faith, uh, who would eventually die for his faith. And he would say that the more I study the world's religions, the more beautiful Jesus appears to me. And I think as you see the ripple effects of the gospel in history, in various pockets in, of, of, you know, of this or that civilization or predominantly in the West, we see that the beauty of Jesus is pronounced. You remove the influence of Jesus and you say, wow, the world is a much, much darker and scarier and grotesque place. I began with India and let me just finish with India here. There are people in India who are in a, well, not really a caste, it's no caste, but they, uh, they are, their job for their entire lives is to sweep up human excrement and dump it in some place off of the roads. And, and uh, you know, there's this one woman who, who spoke about this uh, experience herself and how she, uh, as she was cleaning up this, uh, this human excrement, uh, her foot slipped and she said, my leg sank into the excrement up to my calf. And she screamed and ran away and, and she just said, she cried because she knew this is how she would, this is what she would have to do the rest of her life. A friend of mine, again, mentioned Dr. Tom, Tom Wolf. He talks about a friend of his who grew up doing this very thing on the streets of India in one major city. And he said that, you know, he did it, his grandfather did it, his, you know, his, you know this had been the family's job to sweep up human excrement. But then this man heard about Jesus. He heard that there is a God who loved all human beings, who made human beings in his image, who sent his son into the world to rescue those human beings, to bring them out of bondage, out of oppression, and so forth. And this message so changed this excrement sweeper that he would eventually rise in the ranks. He would be so motivated. He ended up going to Oxford University to get his doctorate. And he would, he would summarize his testimony this way. He would say, because of Hinduism, I used to sweep sheet. But because of Jesus, I went to Oxford University. The power of the gospel to transform lives. May we be those who transform, bring transformation, the message of the gospel to others who are in need, to bring light into the dark places of the world. Thanks so much for listening. We'll be happy to take your questions. <clears throat> or we can leave it right there. That's fine too. All right, got a couple of comers here. Yeah, Dr. Uh, uh, Copen. Um, so, you know, one of the problems I have with this kind of message is that um, when you when you talk about the benefits or the great things that, say, Christian culture has done, it's it's almost like you could have a sense that it's a little bit of cherry picking. Is there a level of cognitive dissonance in the bad that? Um, Christ or Western monotheistic cultures have um, imparted into the world. And the idea, 
the idea of apologetics is kind of to face the truth and to actually be honest and courageous to bring the truth to this generation and mm -hmm. not to deny the, uh, we'd say the crimes of humanity that were at the hands of Western monotheistic cultures. That is really the historical record. Which is, do you have in mind, by the way? Let's see. We could start with the Atlantic slave trade from uh, the 15th century through the 19th century. We could talk, that includes the Middle Passage. We could talk about um, the Berlin Conference of 1884, the colonization and destruction of Africa, that actually the missionaries going there today are, are still kind of like helping to address the, the havoc and the chaos that was wreaked in, from that conference when the continent was divvied up and the resources were stolen and the, the incredible resources from Africa. That was one of the killer apps, if you think about it, that fueled the Western civilization. I mean, we can talk about the Trail of Tears. We can talk about okay. the genocide of the indigenous people. We can talk about Jim Crow. We can talk about a lot of things yeah. where the, there's been a cognitive dissonance. And we don't want to rewrite history. History is yeah. there. Yeah. But the effectiveness of apologetics is facing the truth and dealing with the real issues that really mm -hmm. affect people today. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. Well, good. Excellent question. Um, that's why I like to quote a lot of atheists. Uh, I like to quote people who stared all of these things in the face, people like Rodney Stark or Brian Stewart, and they have said, when I look around at the world and I want to see people in the hell holes, I find Christians there. That is remarkable. You know, you also see Christians who are fighting slavery too. Oh, let's not forget, uh, they are the ones who are, and, and what I'm trying to do is say, I'm not just saying anyone who takes the label Christian. When I'm talking about people who are living faithful lives, when they're living consistently with the teaching of that world voice, Jesus of Nazareth, that is when you see the kind of transformation taking place. Jesus also says, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, uh, didn't we prophesy in your name? Didn't we perform miracles in your name? Didn't we cast out demons in your name? Jesus will say, depart from me. I never knew you, you workers of lawlessness. So Jesus himself says, yeah, there are a lot of people who will take the label, but, uh, but they're a far cry from what Jesus is, uh, is, is calling people to do. So I'm not at all denying that there have been uh, misuses, but I'm also talking about missionaries who stood between those colonial powers to bring about those moral reforms. Uh, that's why I'm quoting people like Robert Woodbury, who couldn't get his article published until he produced additional 190 pages of additional documentation to show that these missionaries were actually the ones who were bringing about these moral reforms, that he was dealing with a very skeptical audience, people who were, they, they wanted to get this right. And if you, read, if you read Robert Woodbury's article, you will see the massive amount of documentation that is there. In fact, Philip Jenkins, uh, a noted historian, gets pop published by Oxford University Press. Uh, he said, I have looked at Robert Woodbury's work on these missionaries and the impact that they have had, these Protestant missionaries. He said, I cannot find a hole in it. And this is a world-class historian here. So, uh, so what I'm trying to do is quote people, as I said, not just, yeah, let's quote those Christians. But I'm quoting people who have, you know, who have done journalistic work, uh, you know, into the Christian faith, who have written themselves into the Christian faith, like Rodney Stark, people who have seen the remarkable impact that the gospel has made. It doesn't mean that we're papering over certain wrongs that have been done. And what I'm saying is when people are living out their faith consistently, that is where we see societies, you know, communities transformed. And notice how I began. I started talking about Hinduism and the theology of Hinduism. And I've talked about the importance of ideas, how ideas have consequences, how they shape minds, how they shape societies, how they shape morality. And I, th I think I laid out, a, you know, again, someone from India himself laying out the, the, the story 
of how there is something severely deficient with Hindu theology. Uh, so, so I, again, I'm not. Uh, this isn't a blind eye or cognitive dissident, uh, you know, dissonance. Uh, I am quoting people who themselves are skeptical of the Christian faith. People who would like to have an alternative narrative, like Jurgen Habermas, but he says there is no alternative explanation for this. So I'd say talk to those people, talk to those skeptics, talk to those atheists. Um, I'm simply calling them in as expert witnesses to uh, to point this out. So so yes, we want to be balanced, but uh, but uh, you know as I said, religion poisons everything. We began with that, uh, and Christopher Hitchens is very good at pointing those things out. Um, but but. A lot of times they are, there's a lot more cognitive dissonance going on in those sorts of narratives that have absolutely no room whatsoever for the positive influence of the Christian faith and the impact that it has had in society. So anyway, there you have it. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. This may be kind of a generic question. and. But I know you're talking a lot about Hinduism. I have a friend, I have a friend who's about 23, 22, about to graduate from college. He's a Hindu. He grew up in, he grew up in India, came over, his family. He, seemed, he may have a little bit of the American dream. I'm not sure. But he and I have gotten to be pretty good friends. And he's, obviously, he's not what? He's a, I'll, him and I have gotten to be pretty good okay, friends. Okay. Say, yeah, and any Christian worth his salt wants to see everyone in heaven. So my question to you is, how would, what would be the best method to introduce him to Christ, besides having a, a loving personal relationship with my friend, which is a great way, but, you know. Sure, yeah. I mean, um, be praying for your, uh, for your Hindu friend, your Muslim friend. Um, yeah, I, I think friendship is going to be important. Uh, you know, uh, talk to your heavenly father about your friend before you talk to your friend about your heavenly father. Um, you know, you want to, uh, you know, I think also find out from him what his, uh, you know, what his beliefs actually are. Uh, you know, you could let him be the expert on Hinduism so that you can in a sense, sit at his feet and learn about his own system. Uh, we are, I think, our tendency is, uh, contra runs contrary to James 1.19, where, which says, let everyone be quick to listen and slow to speak. We're often very, you know, quick to speak, very slow to listen. And so I think being a good listener earns the respect of the person uh, whom you are uh, trying to reach. Uh, I also would em emphasize the uh, the. Uh, the importance of, you know, a, a number of uh, a number of doctrines, like the doctrine of karma, uh, the gospel, for even the highest caste Hindu, brings karmic relief. A little pun there for you. Uh, um, that there is, in the doctrine of forgiveness, is a, you know, the Jesus Christ brings a you know, forgiveness to the past, setting us in right standing with God. That, you know, and I would encourage you to read a book like uh, Death of a Guru by Rabbi Maharaj, um, or in, there's a, a very nice chapter um, in the book Finding God at Harvard by Kelly Monroe, who, uh, you know, there's a Sundar Krishnan who tells about his own story of coming out of Hinduism and how this doctrine of forgiveness really spoke powerfully to him because he, even though a high caste Hindu growing up in Trinidad, lived with great fear. You know, even in his chanting, how have, am I? How can I be sure that I've chanted perfectly and precisely? Uh, and, and you know, and, and so he was in, out of fear. He would do everything over just to make sure that he got it. Kind of like a, a Hindu version of Martin Luther. You know, he just just felt very, you know, very conscious about his own failure, about his own inadequacy, and so forth. And how the doctrine of forgiveness spoke to him. So there, again, I think just read people uh, who have come out of Hinduism. Uh, and, and again, read Death of a Guru. Uh, that's an excellent place to start. And, and just, uh, uh, again, let the conversation continue. Let your friend you know, see that you take your faith seriously. Because for, for Hindus, uh, 
life is often pervaded by this sense of the sacred, of the religious, uh, if you will, and, uh, and, and they want to see that you take your faith seriously. It's not simply a matter of what you do on Sunday and then everything else falls apart the rest of the week. So again, a number of, uh, number of things could be said, but uh, start reading the stories of people who have actually come out of Hinduism or those who have ministered to Hindus uh, and, and let that person inform you about you know, his own understanding of Hinduism because there are many, many versions of Hinduism and, uh, and you know, instead of trying to read the textbook, just let that person inform you about his understanding of Hinduism and, and, and take things step by step. Yep, thank you. Oh, yes, hi. Hi, um, so I was in a dialogue with an uh, atheist friend and one of the, um, the arguments or things that he found was really angry about concerning Christianity was particularly in the Old Testament where there were incidents which he said promoted either rape culture or um, the dehumanization of women. For example, the forcing of women to be married to their rapists, um, female slaves being taken as concubines, etc. And while I've, you know, absence and studied it and, you know, have been able to draw conclusions, I would still was wondering if you had any particular resources that were good in answering these kind of objections to Christianity. Uh, there's a book that I think you might find helpful. It's called Is God a Moral Monster? by Paul Copan. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> um, which actually goes into uh, a lot of detail on that, that, um, you know, this whole idea of, you know, yeah, marrying the, the person who raped you and so forth. Well, we're talking about, for, for example, statutory rape. There is consent here, but it's like with a minor. Uh, and so it is not, and again, I don't, don't want to get too, too sidetracked here, but that is one place I would point you to. Another one would be uh, in the... You know, a, a book on Old Testament violence, and that is, uh, did God really command genocide? That I co that I co-authored with Matthew Flanagan. Uh, but those would be places that, are, that I would look. And, and it's interesting that when you look at the treatment of women, uh, you see how the. Old Testament law actually elevates women in contrast to the surrounding society. Uh, you know, a, a son is told to uh, you know, honor his father and his mother. Uh, that the uh, that the uh, that women like the daughters of Zelophehad had were. You know, they said, "Why is it that we have you know don't have inheritance rights when our father dies? Why is it going to go to his brother?" Um, and uh, Moses brings it to the Lord, and the Lord says, "They're right. They have a claim upon their inheritance." It should be given to them. So, so there are these sorts of appeals being made. It is it, the Bible is you know speaking into a patriarchal culture. So a lot of these assumptions uh, are there. But what we want to do is point people back to the beginning, uh, where you are seeing God making a woman equal to the man. That they're made, being made out of the rib, uh, and, uh, and and so forth. That there is this fundamental equality that is being pictured uh, there. So so anyway, the the book goes into more detail. If you want to go into a lot of detail on this, uh, there's a book by the Old Testament scholar uh, Richard Davidson, who wrote a book called The Flame of Yahweh, uh, published by Hendrickson Publishers, Richard Davidson. And it is a treatment of sexuality in the Old Testament, and it is uh, probably about 700 some pages of material there. And it's very, you know, very well documented, uh, very comprehensive, and, and that might be another good place to look. Okay, thank you very much. We'll play the last question. Last question, okay. Okay, and uh, I've heard all the facts about how Christianity, uh, the Christian belief, can transform society. That's what I, I mm -hmm. get pretty much. And uh, what is your position of the theology of liberation in that sense? The theology of? Of liberation. Liberation, of liberation exactly. theology. What is your position of that um, view, um, if, you're not, if you don't agree with it, how far do you think we Christian might use it in society? Yeah. Well, um, liberation theology comes in many flavors. Uh, there, you know, and and I'd, I'd say it does predominantly come out of a European context that has been shaped by Marxism. So there is that, uh, again, philosophical underpinning 
that is shaping much of the uh, language of liberation theology. Now, there are some who have appropriated it and have used liberation theology to highlight that there are indeed structures of oppression, that there are, uh, you know, that are there are societal barriers to uh, human flourishing that these things are uh, structural, uh, not simply resolved by uh, individual choices and so forth, but are more deeply embedded. And so we, I think, can learn and understand uh, those sorts of things that liberation theology does uh, point out those, uh, those the, the reality of, of those structures. And, and I think that we as Christians should take those kinds of structures, those uh, principalities and powers, if you will, the, these demonically inspired uh, structures of oppression to, uh, to engage in prayer, to engage in uh, transformational ministry in which we break down the walls of reconciliation by building bridges, say, uh, across racial boundaries, where we uh, cross economic boundaries to, uh, to uh, assist people who are uh, underprivileged and so forth. But I think that there are dangers, too, where we uh, presume that the poor are the godly and that the rich are the oppressors. You see Jesus, who is supported by wealthy people. Uh, you see Paul saying that, uh, you know, Paul command, tells Timothy to, in First Timothy 6 to command those who are rich in this world not to put their trust in the uncertainty of riches, but to put their trust in God and also to be rich in good works, to be generous with their resources. So, so he's not saying to become poor. The poor are not to be imitated, but to be helped. And, uh, and, and so the, the wealthy can use their resources for godly purposes. The poor can be very greedy as well. They can be lazy and so forth. And the scripture talks about the lazy poor, you know, look to the ant, you sluggard, and so forth. Um, so so it's, it's a much more nuanced picture. And, uh, and so I would be very careful about how to appropriate liberation theology. I think it does hit on some of those points of structural oppression and so forth. Um, but I, I think there are some of the, uh, you know, and it does remind us of God's concern for the poor, for the disadvantaged and so forth, and we ought to embrace that. But, but it's not as though we should, therefore, you know, as many liberation theologians do, equate the, 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 you know, the poor with the godly. Uh, and so, so again, there are a number of different directions which I could go, but those are a few, a few thoughts. You may want to take a look at the book. I co-authored a book called uh, Introduction to Biblical Ethics, uh, in which we go into some of those, uh, Robertson McCulkin and I go into some of those themes that uh, I think you'll, that relate to this very topic. So anyway, there you have it.